Welcome to Wisdom of the Elders, and this has been going on since the year 2010. Every year, three people have been put up here on the griddle and have <laughs> given a good accounting of their life, life's work. And uh, I'm Sonny Oaks. I came up with the brainstorm of doing this. And on the far end is Bruce Swan, who obviously is not one of the elders. Representing the children's table. <laughs> Bruce Swan is a DJ at WPKN in Connecticut, and he's on the board of directors there, and he is also on the board of directors of Connecticut Folk. So he has some good folk creds, and he's young, and we need young people, so that's why I invited him to be a co-host. I never co-host alone because I'm too wild in my presentation. I don't take notes. I have no idea what I'm going to say like just now, <laughs> before I say it. So I need somebody who's a little bit more anal, who I know will have notes and will be able to make this thing seem professional, right? <laughs> we need that. So what we're going to do is we're going to do three 15, well, approximate 15 minute interviews. It might be 10, might be 16, whatever. And then we're going to have general questions to the people involved. And our three elders this year are Josh White, Jr., Diane Tankle, and Rod McDonald. And Bruce is going to start out by interviewing Josh. Josh White, yes. Uh, first of all, my, my many thanks to Sonny for including me in this distinguished panel, and um, big credits to the people that have preceded us. I, I hope I live up to some of their hard work that they've done, and they've set a, a very, very high standard and big shoes to fill. And also a big thanks to the folks at NERFA for all the hard work that they've done leading up to this weekend and through this weekend, as well as the volunteers and the staff members. So if we can maybe just give them a, a big round of applause. They worked so hard. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, the, the, the novelty of being invited to do something like this wears off pretty quickly. And then the terror takes over. And it's okay, because Sonny gave me some great advice. She said, just watch the YouTubes. I thought, okay, great. So, you know, I haven't had any sleep for, since then. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm watching all these like, great interviews. <sighs> Thanks, Sonny. So I, I have gotten no sleep, but I've had a few nightmares. And the nightmare was that I was sitting in this room in my pajamas. And I've had this dream for quite a few times. But that wasn't the bad part. Sonny said, oh, Bruce, the striped ones, really? That was the worst part of the dream. <laughs> so I'm going to ask a question now um, for something to think about towards the end. And I would ask this question of all the panelists. Uh, of all the interviews that you've done over the years and all the people you've met with and conversations you've had, what is the one question that you wish had been asked? So at the, at the end of the interview, you said, wow, we should ask this. So that's my question. And we'll talk about it at the end. As you're thinking about how this afternoon is unraveling, what would be the one question that you wished somebody had asked you? But no answers now. OK, so let's hang on to that. Um, I'd like to welcome Josh White Jr. to our stage this afternoon. Um, a long, wonderful, illustrious career in the industry as a childhood actor, as a, an adult actor, a musician, an activist, an educator, uh, Grammy nominee, Tony Ward re recipient. I'm sure I missed lots of it, and we'll, we'll delve into that. So it's, it's a great pleasure to have you here this afternoon, Josh. Thank you. I appreciate being here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, your time with children, spending, delivering children's music and meeting with children, what, what wisdom are you imparting to children today as you meet with them? Well, you try and make sure that you stay positive with them at the, in the first place, you know? And you try and make sure that you speak. I know when I started doing with children, I thought, uh, I can handle the double digit people. I'm not, the, the single digit was different for me, you know? But I realized I didn't have to change. All I had to do is remember the age group I'm speaking to and just be me. I didn't have to change. And that to me was very important. I thought, going from this to that, I'm going to have to revamp myself. You don't have to re revamp. You just be yourself all the time. And the children? With children. With everybody. Oh, yeah. And, it's, <laughs> and, they're, they're, and they're fun to speak with. You know, I find that when I started doing music for 
the single digit crowd, I had more fun than doing it with the double digit. I have a lot of fun with the single digit. I, I would imagine the hours are a little bit different too. <laughs> well, I tell you. <laughs> Maybe not your thing. own children. But <laughs> I never had to sing at eight o'clock in the morning before. <laughs> that was something to deal with. That was truly something. I didn't know if I could. <laughs> But well, I did, I love it. Do you share with the children that at perhaps their age, you two were involved in um, acting and, and presenting yourself to, to kids and to adults? Did they ever ask you about it? Did they say, you know, not possible. How, how were you ever as, as young as us and, and did this as a kid? Do they? Well, I let them know that, first of all, I started when I was four. Right. So I, I thought I'd loaf for the first three years. Um, <laughs> and, and it was easy because I sang with my own man. And when you sing with your father, there's no more security than that mm -hmm. when you're on stage. So uh, that was just, it was, at times you feel more comfortable on stage than off. Okay. You feel more in control on stage than off. And that's how it was with me. And I just, uh, I, because you're in control, you feel, <laughs> again, more control on stage than off stage. Then off stage, you're a normal person, and all of a sudden, all kinds of things can happen. But you're on, if you're on stage, you kind of have more control, so you feel a little more comfortable. What, um, what advice do you give the children as, you, as your songs and within your message, as you're actually speaking? It's not to them? that I, I give direct advice. It's the songs that I sing, them, the positive songs that I make sure that uh, they hear. They make, I make sure that they don't hear anything negative coming from me. You don't know when they go home what they have to deal with. But I know for the 45 minutes or hour I'm with them, all they're going to get is positive. Right. And to me, that is very, very important. Again, because I don't know how their lives are when I'm not with them. Do you prefer <laughs> to perform for big spaces or small spaces? What's it your... don't matter to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the people. It's not the place. It's all the same. All, they're the people. Yeah. Well, your performances include such wonderful places as Kennedy Center, Carnegie Hall, Hammersmith Hall, Madison Square Garden, all the big spots. What's left? Where would you like to play? Of, of all the places you've played, where would you like to go back to? And all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Do so them all you again. bookers out there. Do them all again. I mean, it's, it's when you're comfortable at what, with what you do, um, <laughs> and the sound is good, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Let's just go and do it. Right. Right. Growing up as a, as a child, working with your father, um, was it tough? To, was there... Was it father-son relationship? Was it uh, manager, uh, co-worker? What was father, the father-son? Father-son always. The old man makes sure it was always father-son, and um, and that was fine because that's all I knew. Right. <laughs> so it didn't matter. It was the, that was my life. You spent so much of your life uh, paying tribute to your father and expressing his music and making sure that we don't forget about it. How do you think he would feel about the work you've done so far? Well, it's interesting because before, my dad died in 1969. And um, somewhere in the 60s, I found Bob Gibson. Bob Gibson and his 12-string guitar. And I was off. And I heard that my old man had spoken to our manager, and he was thinking that his style of guitar was going to go because I'm now more doing the 12-string stuff than his stuff. So he was, he was, I don't know if I want to say worried, but he was thinking that maybe that which I'd gotten from him uh, would be overtaken by the Bob Gibson influence in me, which was not right at all. Uh, and I, I, I enjoy today uh, doing songs that my own man did the way he did them, because that is very important, not just the song he did, but the way he did it. So people can hear how my father did a song. That, to me, that is, <coughs> it is important for me to, uh, to give his stuff. Do me, but always have a segment of this is what my old man used to do and how he used to do it. That, to me, is very important. I do it for me as much as those who remember my old man. Mm -hmm. And for those who never heard my old man, they get a chance to hear what my old man used to do and hopefully follow up and check him out on their own. Do you feel it, a sense of responsibility? Is it ever a burden for you? Oh, absolutely not. It's a joy. It's truly a joy. I mean, just, you know, 
Think about it. To be able to have a parent that did something like that and to be able to let someone else know who never knew about him mm -hmm. or her what they did, you, you, you're, you're proud. You get pleasure in it. And who would you have carrying on your music forward? If you can pick, you pick someone. I've got a grandson pick. that I think, I mean, I've got, I have, I married a lady with four kids and I've got two and, and all six uh, appreciate music. Let's put it that way. Some even can carry a tune. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, um, what can I say? Um, I've, God, I've lost what, what I was, where I was going. Forgive me. That's okay. You're Sorry. an elder. It's okay. <laughs> But for some reason, I don't know why, when you ask about the question, um, about uh, the, uh, my thoughts, I remember when I, I worked with my old man for 17 years. June of 1961, I uh, started singing on my own. And my, the first joint I worked was in Michigan. I'm a New York City person, born and raised. And June 1961, in Detroit, I could not find a hotel or motel that would take me in June of 1961 in Detroit, Michigan. I had to rent a room from a black family in order for me to sing June 1961, Detroit, Michigan. I still can't get over that. Can't get over that. Well, for as painfully overt or clear of the discrimination towards people of color in the early 60s. Have we come significantly farther? Is, are, we, are we treating um, African Americans, people of color, fairly in the music industry and the representation? And, and, and what, what, what fairly can is we do? Fairly is an interesting word, fairly. Um, Evenly, as the same. I, I can't speak for all. Um, Things work well for me, but there are so many others that I cannot speak on or about, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what else to say on that right now. No, it's okay. It's all right. Um, that more or less concludes my, my first segment of questions, Sonny, so maybe I'll pass to you. Okay, well, <clears throat> since Josh's segment is over, Josh, would you get your guitar, please? I certainly will. I'm going to ask him to play one song for us. And it will be very casual, no fancy microphones and all of that. But you have to remember, he's been around long enough. Do you remember the time when the performers got up, like my brother and Paxton and all of them? One microphone for both. As a matter of fact, you can use mine. One microphone for both vocal and instrument. All right, well, I spoke about the old man. Let me maybe do a song from the old man. If I could have a little more guitar, please. I went down to that St. James Infirmary 
And I saw some plasma there I upped and asked the doctor man Now was the donor dark or fair? The doctor laughed, great big laugh And he puffed it right in my face He said, a molecule is a molecule, son And the damn thing has no race and that was news, yes, that was news. That was very, very, very special news. Cause ever since that day, we've had those free and equal blues. You mean you heard that Dr. declare that the plasma in that test tube could be a white man, black man, yellow man, red? <laughs> That's just what that doctor said. Then he put down his doctor book and gave me a very scientific look and he spoke out plain and clear and rational. He said, metabolism is international. And that was news. Yes, that was news. That was very, very, very special news. Cause ever since that day we've had those free and equal blues. So I stayed at that St. James Infirmary. <laughs> I couldn't leave that place. It was too interesting. <laughs> so I said to the doc, give me some more of that scientific talk, doc. And he did. He said, melt yourself down into a crucible and pour yourself out into a test tube. And what have you got? 3,500 cubic feet of gas. That's the same for the upper and lower class. Well, uh, I had to let that pass. <laughs> Carbon, 22 pounds, 10 ounces. Iron, 57 grains. Not enough to keep a man in chains. 50 ounces of phosphorus, whether you're poor or prosperous. Uh, hey, buddy, can you spare a match? <laughs> Sugar, 60 ordinary lumps, free and equal rations for all nations. Then you take 22 teaspoons of sodium chloride, that's salt, add 38 quarts of H2O, that's water, mix two ounces of lime, a pinch per quart of potash, a drop of magnesium, a bit of sulfur, a soup of hydrochloric acid, and you stir it all up and what are you? <laughs> a walking drugstore. <laughs> An international metabolistic cartel. And that was news, yes that was news. So listen, you African and Indian and Mexican, Mongolian, Tyrolean and Tartar. The doctor's right behind the Atlantic Charter. The doc's behind the new brotherhood of man. As prescribed at Gettysburg, Iwo Jima, at Bull Run and at Guadalcanal. Every man, everywhere is the same When he's got his skin off And that was news, yes that was news That's the free and the equal blues That was a nice musical interlude. <coughs> Josh White Jr. Okay. Well, way back in the early 80s, I had the privilege of meeting this force of nature, <laughs> the woman sitting in the middle here, who, <laughs> name it, she's done it. Name the organization. She's not only been a part of it, she always somehow rises to the top. She always ends up doing so much of the work for whatever organization she volunteers for. So if she volunteers for your organization, run. <laughs> because she's going to take it over, I promise. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm talking about Diane Tankle. And... The thing, reason I wanted Diane on this panel, and I begged her, she didn't want to do it. I said, Diane, I said, you are NERFA. 
If it weren't for Diane, Nerva would not exist. And she hides in her office year after year. It's been 23 years now. You never see her. And it's because of her that you're all here and that all of this is happening. She, well, it started out with Folk Alliance, but be, I, I don't even know where to begin with you, Diane. There's so much. Let me ask you, how did you first get involved with folk music? What was your first involvement? Folk dancing. Michael? Folk dancing, actually. I, uh, well, in addition to going to camps when I was younger and in my teens and being involved in B'nai B'rith, where of course you're singing all the civil rights songs. And I was a folk dancer. I did international folk dancing. I specialized in Balkan dancing. And while I was home during uh, the day in Philadelphia teaching blind students mobility, we would drive up to Barnard College in the evenings to uh, go to Marty Koenig's Classes, who was an ethnomusicologist under Margaret Mead, and he brought back all these dances. And then we would drive back the same night, teach all day fr uh, Friday, and then go back Friday night again <laughs> to Barnard, too. I think it was David Henry's classes. Okay, and then you got involved in something called Swords into Plowshares. How did that happen, and why did it happen? Um, I was a big fan of Bright Morning Star. And I was, excuse me, in the Philadelphia Folk Song Society. In fact, <clears throat> excuse me, I was booking their monthly concert series. In her spare uh, time. In my spare time, right. <laughs> um, and um, Charlie, asked, Charlie King from Bright Morning Star asked if I couldn't get him um, a concert. And the Folk Song Society had made it clear that I couldn't have him for one of the concerts there because he was too political. I went to the Troubadour, I went to Cherry Tree, and basically, this is in the early 80s, everybody told me that they just don't do that kind of music right now, topical music. And I knew nothing about producing a concert, thank you. So I uh, decided, I guess I gotta do it myself. And I got together with Joyce Brown. We formed Swords into Plowshares. The first concert we put on was Charlie King, Judy Gorman Jacobs, and Ray Naylor, who's here this weekend. And um, it was a smashing success. I mean, we got all sorts of publicity. In fact, Robin got us a third page article in the Inquirer where you just opened it up and there was a big picture of Judy Gorman Jacobs and the concert ended up being standing room only. And uh, it was a very, very successful series for a number of years. Okay, and then after Source and the Plowshares, well, I met you at People's Music Network right. in, I believe in Boston. Um, no, the, it was in New York. Well, it was, oh, even earlier, okay. Yeah. And then... Uh, I made the mistake of saying yes when you asked if I would come work on the Philly People's Music Network. <laughs> we, we both seem to have the same problem. We've, we look in the mirror and we practice saying no, 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 no. And then when the phone rings, okay, yes. <laughs> so I totally relate to Diane. I know where she's coming from. Okay, so how involved did you get with People's Music Network? Um. Like besides the two Philly ones that you ran. Uh, well, I actually got involved um, planning the one in Philly in 85, and uh, I was asked to be on their steering committee. And uh, they were wonderful, inspirational weekends that they had, but they were losing their shirt. <clears throat> and that was because anybody who wanted to come to uh, a weekend could show up at the last minute, say they needed a scholarship, and they were invited to come. Well, that part of it, <coughs> excuse me, is okay. But uh, it made it so that Joanne, the cook, couldn't plan. I mean, we end up with 200 people um, at the weekend, maybe 60 would register in advance, and the other 140 would show up, and she'd have to go to a local store and cook for them. And I just started um, expressing that I was uh, an accountant and this isn't the way to do things. And, 
and, and try to help them when I was on the steering committee. And um, I remember someone saying to me that I have no idea what it's like to live from hand to mouth, to not know when you're going to have your next gig and um, not know where you th you're going to be able to afford to come to the weekend. And I, well, first of all, that's not true because I was brought up living hand to mouth. And second of all, I said, how about just a commitment? I will be at the weekend. I'm not sure now how much I can pay or whether I'm going to need a scholarship, but I will be there. So I fought a lot, but the more I fought, the more they wanted me because they really wanted, I think, to be organized, even though they said they didn't. Well, we have tightened it up for you, mm -hmm. At least they had a commitment to more people. Right, right. We still don't turn anyone away. Right. Well, no, that's fine, but to, uh, another thing that I suggested, yes, is if they um, show up at the last minute, bring your own food. Very good. Okay, uh, so that was People's Music Network. Then there's a sidebar to the Philadelphia Folk Song Society, the spring thing. How many years did you run that? 34 years. <laughs> Only 34. <laughs> <laughs> and what did that involve? Well, that's when about 400 people, families mostly with children, microphone, took over a children's camp and um, made music morning, noon, and night. There were workshops, but um, there was children's workshops. I made sure that the kids um, had something um, every single hour, whether it was crafts or singing, and this went on for Memorial Day weekend for three days. There was something like 80 week workshops during the weekend, and it was really a breeding ground for the young people who are now on Broadway stages that started out on the children's open stage at Spring Thing. Yeah, I remember, Rod, I drove you down to Spring Thing one year. It was great. <laughs> we had a blast. Yeah. All right, Diane, so that was Spring Thing. Now let's get into uh, Folk Alliance because that's basically where we are today. But before NERF even existed, I remember Diane called me up and she said, Sonny, I'm going to this meeting out in Malibu to start a new folk umbrella organization. Would you like to come with me? And I said, yeah, that's just what we need, another, another darned organization. I said, no thanks, I'm not interested. So I didn't go to Malibu, but Diane did. And what happened from that? And Bob did. Um, well, there were, how many were there, 200? I don't, not that many. 140 sounds right, yes. And um, uh, we met for three days to talk about the possibility of forming an umbrella organization for all of folk. Um, and um, it was really exciting because up until that point, I had been booking the monthly concerts for the Folk Song Society and had spoken to these people from all the agencies because yeah, I had a book the performers through their agents, and to finally put a face <clears throat> with the person that I had been talking to for uh, a while was really an exciting <coughs> thing. And we saw it as becoming an organization of organizations. Um, turns out that that's not the way that it was. But after three days of having meetings, <coughs> excuse me, of, <coughs> of, of having meetings, um, Bob had a meeting on the last day. Take a drink of tea, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. We promised her hot water and we got it. <laughs> yes, thank you, Ginger. Um, and the meeting that he led was when a resolution was finally made that yes, we're going to start an organization. And because we were a new organization and there was no money, and <clears throat> What happened is that we formed a steering committee and 16 people uh, plus a facilitator came to our house in Philadelphia that we were able to offer everybody staying at our house where we could meet twice for four days each time to form the organization. Um, and we also had the support of the Philadelphia Folk Song Society behind us. Um, they were able to cater it and pay whatever expenses they, uh, there were, picking up people. And um, we formed the organization. We had the first meeting in Philadelphia. 
and it soon took a different turn, but I believe the direction it went was the direction that fulfilled the need that needed to be met of booking. And what year was that? Um, it was 1989 when we went to Malibu, and the first conference was in Philadelphia in 1990. All right, so that was Folk Alliance. All right, well, that didn't satisfy Diane. That wasn't good enough. And besides, she was getting bored again. So she came up with another idea, and that idea is where we are today. Would you talk about how that came about, NERFA? Oh, <clears throat> excuse me again. Well, uh, NERFA um, is obviously Northeast Regional Folk Alliance, and the Folk Alliance was broken into regions right at that first conference. Of course, they used the Mason-Dixon line to divide the, uh, 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 the Southeast from the Northeast. Um, I went to the conference in Boston in 1994, and all of a sudden it was so cutthroat. I felt like the performers that were there were competing with one another. And I said to somebody else who had been in Malibu with us, what have they done to our baby? It, the, the, the feeling had totally changed, and I wanted to have a regional meeting that would be in a resort, where it would be, uh, just take it back a couple steps and people could be relaxed, maybe even bring their families. And so we held the first Northeast Regional Folk Alliance in the Pocono Mountains of uh, Pennsylvania at Split Rock Resort in 1994. Um, and I said yes to that invitation. <laughs> And this is our 23rd year. And we... Awesome. Um, and we have uh, moved a few times. Uh, Split Rock, where we started out, became more and more of a um, time-sharing thing so that they would give us less and less rooms so we moved to Kutcher's, and Kutcher's was wonderful, but it literally fell apart right <laughs> under our feet. <laughs> and um, they loved us, and we'd still be there if they were still there. Then we went to the Hudson Valley Resort from uh, Kutcher's, and um, that was okay. Um, I mean, size-wise, we did outgrew it, but the spaces were really nice. All the jamming spaces in the living room and everything had a very warm feel about it. And people were complaining that there was mold and complaining. I mean, we had outgrown it to a point where I wouldn't permit people to take single rooms. They had to have a roommate. I just couldn't spare it any other way. Um, and of course, what was nice about being at all these resorts and why agents used to love to have their roster perform at NERFA was because I promised them a captive audience. Being in a deserted resort with uh, nobody else around, there was no place to go out to eat. Uh, there was, uh, everybody ate together, which really was important in forming the community. And, um, um, and they all came to the showcase together. Um, we lost a little bit of that here, and that, was my main concern uh, when we picked out this hotel, which seemed to be the best of all of, our, of the alternatives. Last year I felt, are we gonna become a commuter festival because this place is so convenient to New York? And the fact that um, there are alternative places to stay and alternative restaurants to eat. Um, so we played around with that a little bit and that's why I had them greatly drop the cost of the hotel room so they were competitive with everything else in the area and sold the meals as a separate package. Okay, I just wanted you to all be aware. I don't think you've ever been aware before of how much Diane does, how much thinking she puts into this, how she lays down the law on things she thinks are important for the benefit of the community. She is so community-minded. And I felt, you know, all these years we've been coming here, and I've had my battles with her, and, and, but I appreciate so much what she has done, and I just wanted you to have that same appreciation, and that's why I invited her to be on this panel.
Okay, Bruce, your turn to take over. You know, hey, could I interject one small Sure, part? of course. I was at that 94 festival, and you're absolutely right. It really felt like a cattle call. Mm -hmm. It was very high pressure, and, um, and I ended up spending an inordinate amount of time in the stairwells jamming with people just so we could get away from everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't feel that way here at all. It's really a very fine environment here for the music, I think. I just wanted to add that to what you said. <clears throat> Rod um, hails from Connecticut, originally from Southington, Connecticut, an educator, a writer, a singer, songwriter, a performer, been at Ner Nerfa several times, Kerrville, Falcon Ridge Folk Festival, um, Dillon Festivals, I've seen him at, and a brief career as an attorney. Um, no. No. In no. Incorrect? Incorrect. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> of all the things you've done, what do you think most prepared you for music and which do you think prepared you the least for your music career? Going to law school prepared me the least, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I got into music uh, almost accidentally. It's kind of weird. I probably should sit closer yes, to the mic. Um, I, kind of, I, I was playing music, but I never really intended to make it a professional thing. Um, I was a working journalist, and I think that really affected my entire um, way of looking at the world and obviously my music because I, I learned a kind of way of approaching the way you think, you know, how you analyze what's going on, the questions you want to ask. And, and I think that my songs are, you know, somewhat analytical and intellectual as a result, maybe more than they ought to be sometimes, but that's me. But um, I got into playing music almost by accident. I was briefly in the U.S. Navy in the JAG Corps, and they sent me up to Newport, Rhode Island, for officer's training school. And I had applied to be a conscientious objector, so I was immediately persona non grata on the entire base. And... Um, I ended up wandering down the waterfront in Newport and I blundered into a club one night and th they didn't have an, anybody working there and the 4th of July weekend was coming. And I blithely asked, you know, do you ever have an open mic? And the guy behind the bar said, do you play? I said, yeah. He said, I lied, really. I had never played anywhere, hardly. <laughs> and, um, and he said, uh, go get your guitar, come right back. So I did and I, I played like two and a half hours while he bought me free drinks and I probably played everything I knew twice, you know. And, and, uh, and then he said, how would you like to play here four nights a week for the rest of the summer? This is like, you know, a high profile gig for all the tourists coming. I couldn't believe it. It turned out that the guy that was supposed to have the job had gone for a pleasure cruise that afternoon with the guy who owned the bar. And the guy who owned the bar was an old Mayflower family guy, and he had decided that some British guy sailing into port he didn't want there, so he fired his cannon at him at the mouth of the port. And the Coast Guard told him if he came back to America, he would arrest him, so he took, so he sailed to England that day with his singer that they'd hired for the summer. And three hours later, I walked in and got the job. And here I am. <laughs> I wish I could say it was some like really calculated thing on my part, but that would be untrue. I think it's better than calculated. <laughs> well, another question to you is um, the work you did in performance space. You, you worked at uh, Speakeasy in Folk City. Mm -hmm. um, how much of the industry has changed since then for you as a performer? Was it easier then to find work? Is it equally as difficult now? What do what you... Well, finding work, you know, has always kind of been a matter of initiative of getting out there and not being too depressed when people say no. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of, I always, uh, I always use the metaphor of being like water flowing around rocks, you know, like if this guy didn't want me, I just considered him a rock and I went around him to the next place. And I would tell people that came to me looking for singing jobs when I was booking the speakeasy, you know, don't let me interfere with your career. If, if, if you don't work for this situation, just find one where you do. So I, when I first started playing in New York, I went around 
and I did everything I could to get hired. I got a gig at an Argentinian restaurant in Brooklyn because he had a vibraphone there, and I played There is a Rose in Spanish Harlem on the vibraphones. And he said, I've never, nobody's ever played this vibraphone before. You want to work here? He didn't even ask me to play the guitar for him. He just hired me because I could do that. So uh, that's getting work, you know, has always been more about getting out in and just being available and stuff. The business, on the other hand, is a, you know, a crapshoot and, and kind of, I don't know, the, the business of folk music has always seemed like an oxymoron. But, uh, <clears throat> but I do feel and always have, I don't think I've ever changed my mind about this, I, I've always have felt that we should be, uh, as a community, more aggressively um, in the mix in the commercial music world. Uh, <clears throat> I've never ap apologized for playing folk music. I've never agreed with those artists, you know, who get who suddenly get a record deal and say, "Oh, I don't play folk music," you know, so that they can be on Warner Brothers or something. I've never b bought into that. I've always felt that we should be who we are and stick up for who we believe in and uh, and say the things we want to say and insist that the world make room for us. I can't say that it's changed anything dramatically. My having that opinion, but that is my opinion. <laughs> And you're sticking to it. That's right, sticking to it. The, um, the industry has changed so much, and, and as you are consulted, or as younger musicians, up-and-coming musicians, and people changing career getting into, into music, uh, what further advice would you have for them? Um, I had this conversation last night with a bunch of young guys. I'm really blown away by how good there is of a younger generation around here these days. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's inspiring. <laughs> you all know Mark Dan. You know, I was in a workshop uh, at Falcon Ridge this summer with a bunch of younger hotshots, and Mark told me before the workshop, he said, you're going to have to up your game, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. I, I'm really inspired by it. But, but I do, uh, I did have this question asked me last night by a couple of them late at night. You know, the thing that, that most made a difference in my ability to have this career that I have, I guess, was um, the community that we had in Greenwich Village that we uh, really consciously looked at the music world out there and said, we have to band together, we have to work together, we have to create events for ourselves, we have to make the public aware of us, and if we stick together, it will be easier than if we bang our heads against the wall individually. And Rod, who was, and in, who was that. in that speakeasy community? Sorry? Who was in that community? You well, uh, you know, some of us are, are still very much actively, you know, making a living. Uh, Massengill, Lucy Kaplansky, uh, Jack Hardy's Go On A Course uh, was a very prominent part of that. Uh, Sean Colvin, Cliff Eberhardt, you know, it's a long list of people. I won't, I won't you know, you guys know who they are. But, uh, mm -hmm. but that sense that we were um, collectively organizing ourselves really helped a lot. Uh, fast Folk got me into the bottom line in New York. I, it was how I ended up on stage at the bottom line. Got to play for, you know, 500 people a night, probably for the first time. Um, fast Folk landed me in Europe. I went over to Europe just for a vacation. And while I was there, I got a phone call out of nowhere from somebody who knew my music from Fast Folk and asked me to come to Germany and play for a, a showcase of, of people who booked folk clubs all over Germany. And uh, I went, and the next thing I knew, I was touring Germany, and then I got a record deal in Switzerland, and I've done like 40 tours over there since that time, lived there intermittently. And that all happened because of Fast Folk. And Fast Folk didn't pay any money. You got nothing for doing Fast Folk. You know, you, you didn't even get a free copy of the record. You had, when Jack was the editor, you had to buy a record that you recorded for free. <laughs> <laughs> It's a rather but, curious uh, business model, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, it really led to a lot of other things. It was a wise, uh, a wise decision to be part of it. <laughs> only two dollars. <laughs> only two bucks. Only two bucks. They used to say, you know, we used to joke around, they would say, you know, it only costs us three dollars to make these records and we sell them for two. <laughs> you know what our secret is? In the end, we'd all say in unison, volume. <laughs> volume, right. 
Well, so much of music today is, is manufactured, put together, and then subsequently given away. The, we find that the artists have to give away so much of their product to have it heard. Is there, is there in your view, is there any way of correcting that? Is there any way to get the musicians back to being able to sell their music and to deliver the product to, be, to, to get paid for it? Wow, I, you know, if there is, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> it's a big um, question. It's a big question. I, I think that, um, I, you know, the, I, I think the folk world is more generous about actually paying for product than the general public is out there. I still sell a fair amount of CDs at my concerts. Um, so this particular crowd of people, not just this room, but I mean in general, is probably less guilty of taking advantage of that than most. But the younger generation, they don't pay for anything. It's all free. And I don't know how that'll ever, you know, you'll ever get that back. On some level, I don't really care. I'll be honest with you, I don't really care if Taylor Swift doesn't make $100 million. Um, I, uh, I, I, I have so little respect for the corporate end of the business that if they all went under tomorrow, I really wouldn't miss them. Um, but the... Uh, musicians that are, you know, just regular working musicians really do need to be able to sell their products. And the small labels need to be able to sell their products to survive. Um, I've been on several of those and it's really very tough to keep going. I don't know the answer to that. Generally, I suppose, if you're on a small label, you, you pretty much have to be out working it. You got to tour, you got you to gotta realize that it's your job, it's your career, it's serious work. The label to to the degree that it's invested in you the label is going to stand or fall on how hard you work and get your product out there so i guess as artists what i would say is do everything you can to get your music out there give it away you know to the people that need to have it and that you need to have have it and then try to sell you know to the general public uh whatever you can and pay attention to what they tell you they like and make more of it <laughs> I don't know. Other than that, what can you do, really? Th that concludes my questions for Rod McDonald. Can we perhaps wrangle a song from him? Yes, we can. Uh, uh, okay, sure. Josh said he would lend yeah. you I didn't bring guitar. one with me. So. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Bruce, if you would straighten out your mic like I did with mine before, because you have the long... You know, yeah. Get it ready for performance. Yeah. Although I'm going to tell my grandchildren I got to play Josh White's guitar. Well, wait, uh -huh. maybe, maybe we should do this side. Are you going to need this? Oh, yes, you'll need this. So. Yeah, I'll need that. So this is, so. Any way you want. Any, any tie it on there? Or? No, here. You just pop it through a hole here. Yeah. This is a real deal here. Yeah. A lot of history in this instrument, I can bet. Let's see if I can make it talk a little bit. Well, you know, we're kind of reminiscing, so I got this fairly new song that's kind of a reminiscence. But um, after I got out of the Navy... Can't hear the guitar. Yeah, you could turn the guitar up a little, whoever's doing yeah. that. Is anybody doing that? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, after I got out of the Navy, I, was, I still had a year of school to go, but I really didn't go to class. I <laughs> sat in my attic in New Jersey and practiced the guitar. I'd read somewhere that Eric Clapton did that for a year and it made him good, so I figured I would try the same thing. <laughs> I'm not sure it worked all that well, but it, it probably helped. So uh, over the winter holiday, a buddy and I went out to San Francisco and... Um, we had a friend who lived in this one-room apartment about the size of this stage up here, and we moved in on him. And uh, he had a job, and my friend was into acting, so he would go down to the um, fisherman's wharf every day and pretend to be a panhandler. <laughs> and I, uh, um, I found this doorway, the Bank of America in Chinatown, 
And every day at five o'clock when the bank would close, it had these like really big red dragons in the doorway and great acoustics and tile and everything. I would stand in that doorway and play every day for a couple hours, make a couple of bucks, five, ten bucks, whatever I could. It was January. It was cold. It was wet. It was San Francisco. But it's like that all year there, so it really wasn't any different in January than, than in August. So this is kind of a reminiscence of that, because last, uh, about a year ago, uh, I was out there with Cliff Eberhard and my buddy Jimmy Bruno, and I talked him into going down and finding the doorway again and taking some pictures. It's still there. The dragons look like they're there forever. The Chinese, man, when they build a doorway, they know what they're doing. <laughs> In a doorway in San Francisco For a month of winter days Two hours every afternoon I stood there and earned my pay It was in the middle of Chinatown January in the air Singing for people on the way somewhere Trying to make them lend an ear it was my first job as a singer Watching all the people react Some would stop for a song or a minute Some would wave as they walked past Now some would walk right into traffic So they wouldn't have to pass near Some guy singing in a back doorway That's the very last thing you'd want to hear well, I guess I've come a long way, at least far enough to say If I knew then what I know now, I'd head right back to Chinatown And do it all again, my friends, yes, i do it all again Now there was one pretty girl in the afternoon Came by every single day with a different guy She'd go upstairs into the hotel across the way I never did meet her, know her name But she always gave me a smile And I want to thank her for the five dollar bills You know they kept me alive a while Now I guess I've come a long way at least far enough to say If I knew then what I know now I'd head right back to Chinatown And do it all again, my friends Yes, to do it all again Now when I wrote this song, I was actually in San Francisco playing a gig And uh, so I went down there that night and stuck the piece of paper on the mic stand You know, with a piece of tape like you do and sang it and it suddenly seemed to me very short because that's really all there is well, very uncharacteristic for me as you know and um, and uh, so I figured well I, I kind of looked out at the crowd and I said well you know maybe you feel the same way about your life as I feel about mine you know that like there was some moment in time and you've been kind of running it down and running it from that point ever since and and here you are and you know Here's your chance to say you kind of like where you are right now. And I asked everybody to sing with me, so I'm going to ask you guys to do that too. Feel free, just, you know, kind of jump right in on this little tune here. See what happens. Well, I guess I've come a long way, at least far enough to say. If I knew then what I know now, I'd head right back to Chinatown. And do it all again, my friend. Yes, I do it all again. I do it all again, my friend. Yes, I do it all again. There you go. Thanks. Thank you very much. I have one Rod story that I want to share before we get into the questions. Rod used to hang at the speakeasy, and I ran the open mic on Mondays at the, every other Monday at uh, Folk City. And for some reason, hmm? 
No. <laughs> Unless she wants to. And uh, so what would happen was, I don't know what was going on, but there wasn't very good feelings between Folk City and Speakeasy. There was a little bit of tension. Yeah. So, uh, and Rod and I were good friends. So what, and some of the people that came up for open mic, I, I don't know if you've, you've been to open mic, sometimes it's <laughs> tough. <laughs> some of the acts are really bad. So I really liked when there was some good music. So what would happen is every time I was there and if Rod was around, he would come walking over from the speakeasy, he would strap his guitar on at the speakeasy, walk around the corner, walk into the door at Folk City, and when I saw him come in, I, I had the, uh, you know, the soundboard and the mic and what have you. As soon as the artist that was on stage got done, I said, and now we have a special guest, Rod McDonald. And he would get up and he would sing his two songs, turn around, walk back out, <laughs> back out the door and back to the speakeasy. <laughs> yeah. He was my salvation on many a Monday night. <laughs> hey, you know, can I mention this? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Open Mic. And somebody last night asked me to bring some copies today, so I have a couple with me if anybody wants to take a look at it after this. But Did it's you? kind of from back in those days when we were all hanging out. You know, the great thing about the open mic scene, what, what we were talking about, was that it, kind of like this, it brought everybody together. Um, every Monday night, even the pros would come down and hang out. And, um, uh, you know... The, the myth is that you only play an open mic if you're trying to get a gig somewhere, but that's not it at all. The guys that are the dedicated songwriters would come in and they would want to try their new material out because you don't want to try your new material out on a crowd that's just paid 20 bucks to see you all that much. You want to try it out on, a, on your, your fellow scribes in a way. And so we'd all come in there and we'd try our new songs out on each other. And then somebody would go, you know, hey, let's go over to this place and have a beer afterwards. And, and it became... Uh, part of how we all really socialized and interacted and, and got it in the workshops uh, like at Cornelia Street happened. And what I was saying earlier about, you know, the community, I mean, this is, I think, a very big part of, of what has really made the music career I've had meaningful to me is, is the involvement with other artists and, and what I've learned from the process. It's, it's so much more uh, a wonderful experience than just being an isolated artist by yourself, I think. Josh, did you ever do open mic? Uh, not really. No? no? <laughs> oh, you're... I'm grateful. I mean, I, I'll sing in somebody's bathroom if they want, so it's not that. <laughs> I'm ready to sing anywhere. And Diane, was there ever any kind of open mic in the places that you ran? Nothing? Well, it was the Bothy Club. That's true. But I didn't run the Bothy Club. You mean there was really? something there was you something didn't you do? Didn't run? <laughs> 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 <We're on pump. laughs> <laughs> okay, but I remember at Spring Thing you had a concert, and uh, oh, yeah. because Rod sang in one of the concerts, you invited me up to sing with you. Why? I don't know. You never did it again, so I guess it didn't uh, work. We had an open stage every Saturday, Saturday night of the Spring Thing, and before that we had the children's Mike, open Mike. stage. Oh, okay, and before that we had the children's open stage. Okay. We called it an open stage, not an open mic. I don't know why. Well, same thing. Yeah. yeah. I can make a comment on what he was talking about. Um, as my involvement in becoming this, uh, at one point I said to the performer, you know, you're, you're showcasing and doing so many gorillas, there aren't enough performers to possibly go around. So you're, you're, just, you're doing these as to, to yourself. In other words, you're singing for, you, for your fellow singers and writers, and are you sure you want to do that? Maybe you should set a limit to the number of gorillas each person should do. And the answer came back overwhelmingly, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to sing to each other and, and get the feedback, and this is our community. So we're happy as a lark if the only audience is our fellow singers. And that's from, from NERFA, the, the early days. At really, uh, my eyes. Right, normally when I put these panels together, I'm very careful about making sure that the people on the panel have interacted in the past. And I don't think that's the case here. Have any of you ever had interactions besides that one spring thing? 
Oh, well, Clearwater. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've, yeah. Been wor- we've worked together on a lot, and, and you and I have Michael. done uh, some, a lot of... Oh, yeah. uh, Josh and I have done... Uh, well, more when I lived in New York than lately, but we, we did a lot of uh, fundraisers for various organizations. We did uh, a concert for the uh, Great Peace March in 1986 down at Rutgers. It was really a blast. And uh, remember the Sanders Theater? The one with the, uh, we did an anti-apartheid concert at Sanders Theater there it is. at Harvard yeah. University that was yeah. fantastic with uh, Josh and, and Pete uh, Seeger and I don't know, there's like about 20 oh, people in it, but yeah. it was really a great experience. I love those things. Uh, they were, those are f- wonderful experiences, especially at that time because uh, for me it was like, oh my God, I'm on stage with people that I've been you know, yeah, idolizing <laughs> for years, and now yeah. suddenly I'm standing here, and Pete Seeger's looking Next. at me and going, "What do you got, Rod?" You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty awesome experience. Yeah. I love it. I, I'd like to see more of that. I, I would actually <laughs> love to see more integration between the older and younger artists uh, up and down the line. Like what you used to do with the Phil Oaks shows at, in, at Folk City, mm-hmm. when you know uh, I'd be following, uh, I'd be on between Astic, Two Step, and Paxton, you know, or something like wow. that. I mean, those are those are incredible moments uh, as an artist. I don't know if it meant all that much to Paxton. Probably, I, w- I would think it meant a lot <laughs> to him to do so. that. But uh, but for those of us that were, you know, uh, the younger squad, you might say it was it was fantastic to be part of those things, and still is. I love doing shows like that. I love the Dylan Fests are a, yeah. a blast. I get to play with people like, you know, the guy who wrote the guitar chart for Hot Rod Lincoln. Uh, showed up at one of our Dylan Fests and he goes, play harmonica with me. So I'm, I'm playing harmonica and we're, you know, running through this adrenaline version of the times they are changing at breakneck speed. It's pretty cool. I gotta say, I love this stuff. I don't remember. Did you ever come to our Thanksgiving sings? I think so. Yeah, I thought so. I used to come down to Philly a yeah. fair amount. It, um, the Philly scenes and the New York scenes were very different. Yeah. Um, the Philly scene was so much better organized than the New York scene was for one thing. <laughs> it's just like you got there and things actually, you know, worked. Everything, no, everybody knew what was going on. It's like, whoa, this is refreshing. Um, but yeah, I'm Explain sure. Explain what your Thanksgiving thing was. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, for 17 years, we had a um, four-story brownstone home in Center City, Philly. And people came from all over to our Thanksgiving sing. Pete and Mara Kennedy would uh, come, I think, up from Virginia then. And I actually stole the idea from Faith Petrick when I had been to a Friday sing uh, at her place uh, at 885 Clayton. And uh, we had jazz on one floor, singer-songwriter in our bedroom, uh, sing-along folk in our office, uh, uh, bluegrass and old timey on the roof deck and the fourth floor, and it literally went on till six o'clock in the morning, and it was always the Friday after Thanksgiving. And Ginger used to come every year early to help me get it set up. <laughs> yeah, we we had over four hundred people there. Yes. <laughs> Josh, where coming through when you were performing? Uh, Rod's home home base is obviously New York. Where was yours? Uh, I was. I'm a New Yorker, born and raised. Yeah, I, I so, live in Michigan now, but New York was. So you were hanging in New York. New York. And which clubs did you play there? Well, um, there was Gertie's Folk City. There was the Bitter End. Um, but my again, my first gig was out of New York, which was in Michigan. Yeah. Trying to think where else that that was. Yeah. Bit around Gertie's. So how, well, what years were you in New York? Well, early 60s. Oh, so you, I, you, you were know. there when it was all happening? But then again, with my old man, there was Cafe Society back in the 40s. Oh. Where, I, where I first started singing was the Cafe Society, which is now one Sheridan Square, uh, middle 40s on. So I, I knew the village that way with uh, working with Dad. I always think of you as a Midwesterner. That's interesting. Born and raised New Yorker. Whoa. I'm tell, yeah, I tell people, if you're born and raised in New York City, you can live anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> After that, bring it on. Uh, Bruce, you have a call? Um, <laughs> yeah, as Rod, you talked earlier about the protest songs of the early 60s, um, and we've sort of gone away from that, but yet there seems to be a current return, and three songs that come to mind right now is... Um, uh, the Neil's song, Tyrants Always Fall, 
the song by uh, Magpie that is um, 10,000 bridges and not a single wall. And uh, the, the song that comes to mind is Zoe Mulford's song, um, My President Sang Amazing Grace. We need more protest songs, and, the, and I think we need to bring more messages consistently to the public. And, and my question is, why aren't we? Why aren't more, do you think? I mean, I, I, for yourself perhaps, why aren't we bringing more protest songs, more social awareness? And um, I mean, there was, there was whole bands that their whole message was societal, social and, and uh, awareness. So that would be my question to, to the panel. I swear I don't know. Well, I'm can I? Myself. I think there are a lot of great protest songs, the three you mentioned and a lot more. Uh, I'm working on a new CD and about half of them are uh, political songs. Uh, it, to me, it's not a shortage of songs and it's, and it's not a shortage of quality songs either. The material is there. The uh, apparatus for getting them out to the public is what's changed. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, you know, uh, you're, you're comparing a, a period of time in which commercial, in which the number one song in America or number two song in America was blown in the wind to a, a period of time in which you wrote blowing in the wind, it wouldn't be played on any major radio station in the United States. Though all the stations are owned by one company that's Republican mm -hmm. and they, don't, they will not allow the general public to hear any of this kind of music. I don't know exactly how you get around that. Uh, Di there's a woman named Diane Crow who's doing a radio show of social justice music and I suppose people that are aware of it and want to hear that will tune it in. I'd like to see more of that. I would like to see more um, uh, of the artists that are successful within folk music getting out to a bigger audience. I just had a long conversation with Joe Jenks the other day at Brother Son. And um, I, I personally believe Brother Son, you know, should be on The Tonight Show and, uh, and should be recording for a major label and playing performing arts centers and not playing coffee houses and, and putting out their own records. Um, but, I, you know, it's not like I can personally make that happen, but that's what I think should be happening. I watched Kirsten Maxwell last night, and the first song that she played, I think, could be a hit song. I think if you produce that modestly and put that out as a... As a uh, as a record uh, to the general public, that every that my kids who are consumers of popular music would buy it in a heartbeat. I don't. I don't think that we should think of ourselves either politically or in any other way as a ghetto of music. We need to be much more aggressive about getting, uh, getting it out there. You know, one of the things that they do in England is they have these huge award shows for folk music, and they broadcast them on national television. Excellent. And then when the artists go out and play, they Excellent. draw two thousand people in. You know, Leeds and Manchester Excellent. and stuff like that. I'd like to see, I'd like to see that kind of thinking in general. That you know, we have this great organization that you've built. You know, uh, not just Nerfa, but the National Folk Alliance, and, and we've got a generation of young artists that really deserve to be heard. I I think that you know uh, that's that needs to happen. That this music needs to get out to the general public, and and in this time of American history more than it ever has needed to get out to the general public. Josh did a, 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 an experience that's not quite protest music. The, talk about the prison thing that you did. Oh, um, yeah, we have young, young delinquents, I guess you want to call them. And, and a buddy of mine asked me to, uh, to go do music for him, and I was a little nervous because I'm thinking, teenagers and folk music can be a bad marriage. You know, if they're not brought up with it. But uh, we went into this place, and uh, all of the young men wrote, and women wrote, uh, wrote journals. And we would go in with them, and we'd get eight or nine of the 300, and we'd work with them, and we would decide on, let's write a song together with these young boys. And we'd pick a topic. Um, and everyone feed a line or two, and Mike and I would go home and put music to it. And, and we, of all the, I was nervous about doing this with these teenagers and I'll always be grateful to this man, Mike Ball, to get me to do this. It is one of the most uh, amazing experiences. And to take these, some of these young boys, if they wanted to give us some of their journals and put music to their words. And then at the end of the week, we'd sing this to the whole 300, I guess, kids and that experience to put music to 
these young boys' words, their words uh, was just, it's an, it was an incredible feeling to, to have, to be able to put to music the words of these young men that came from their heart. And we're able to, I've been able to do that. We've done it eight or nine, ten times. And we now, Mike Ball, this friend of mine, there is an album uh, that we put out of just these songs from these boys that we put music to. And I just laugh at myself because if there was any way I could have gotten out of it before, at first, I would have. But now I will be grateful to my dying day for, for following through with Mike Ball. Just an incredible experience. And I'm, I'll always be grateful, always, always. And Diane, what do you do <coughs> with NERF in terms of programming to... Uh... Oh, I make sure that there's always something um, in, the <clears throat> in the political vein. And I also think, by the way, that the one good thing that we could thank our current uh, president for is that the music is coming back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. Oh, yes. yes, and people are organizing again because of, of, of the times, so. He's given us incentive. Yes, he absolutely <laughs> has. Yes. <laughs> okay, now, I want to go back to what Bruce started out with way in the beginning. He said, what question do you wish had been asked of you? You were interviewed. Oh, me? Well, we'll start oh. on the end here, Josh. Okay. Uh, what, uh, what question didn't Bruce ask you that, you sh that he should not, not only what I didn't ask you, but when you finish many interviews, what, what is the one question that you, you sort of wish had been asked of you? Certainly today, but perhaps in general. Well, I, it's, I, again, I started singing with my father at four years old, and so I've never done anything else. It'd be interesting to see what would I have chosen to do on my own later on in my life? Would it have been music? Would it have been, I mean, at one time I wanted to be a forest ranger because I thought that was a good thing to, for animals and for the forest. So I think that, to ask me that, um, what would I have thought of, what would I have done had I not started at the age of four? Would it have been music or not? I have no idea. You never gave it a thought, no? Huh? So you, you knew what you wanted to be when you oh. grew up. <laughs> l l instant gratification is easy. When you sing at three or four years old and people... <laughs> should you want to do anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Diane, what didn't I ask you that I should have? Um, who's been an inspiration to me? Okay, that's a very good question. <clears throat> yeah, yes, and I can truly say that... Um, I greatly admired Faith Pedrick and Toshi Seeger, and when I was turning 40, they were both in their early 60s, and people were saying to me, oh my God, you're over the hill now, that you were turning 40, and I said, you gotta be kidding. I said, I can't wait to grow up and be just like Toshi Seeger. I, she was just such an inspiration uh, to me, and I really, really tried to emulate her in the work that I did, and I, I felt the same way about Faith, only, of course, I can't sing, in case you can't tell. Um, but uh, I worked with Toshi um, at the Clearwater Festival a lot in the 80s. And um, every time she had a new project in mind, she would give it to me to try out. Like, do you remember that parade we did? Yeah, she wanted me to have a parade of all the uh, workers and performers through the campgrounds. And eventually, I ended up starting a food delivery service and a backstage uh, service. And it's just like every concert that I did, I would talk to her. She was just truly an inspiration and somebody that I wanted to grow up and be just like her. And Rod? I think the question that I don't usually get asked is, what keeps you going? You know, I get asked a lot about my history and, uh, and uh, my views about society and politics and all of that. And that's mildly interesting to you folks probably, or maybe not even, but, uh, but, I, but what, you know, um, I was on tour with Mark Dan this past year, and we'd gotten off the plane and driven five hours and did a gig without any sleep. And then, and then 
After the gig was over, we were sitting around the club, and he took out his bass and he started playing Bach fugues on his bass. And I was getting paid, and I walked over to him and I said, aren't you tired, you know? And he said, well, no, not really, not of the music. My body's tired, but I'm not tired of the music. And then later on, he said to me that he turned 60 and he realized that the one thing he ever really wanted to do in life, besides you know, his family, was get good on the bass. He said, I haven't got that many more years left. I better get busy. <laughs> so I, I find that, that that is kind of, it articulated something that I realized I'd been thinking for some time, that I had been seeking out situations to expand my musical horizons, that I'd, I'd been going into clubs with piano players and asking if I could get up and sing Summertime with them. And uh, I was doing these Dylan festivals and playing, you know, I, I, at the Dylan festivals I sing harmony with Pete and Mara Kennedy all the time. And, and, uh, and I've just been really loving making music and, and getting outside of myself and, and playing new and improved music. And, and I think that I feel that I'm actually getting good, finally, after all these years. I feel like I'm actually getting somewhere near where I always wanted to get as a player and a singer. And I'm hoping that that will continue before I start to lose it, you know. But, uh, and that is actually my biggest motivation is just to keep on playing and loving the music. And I think that as long as I do that, everything else will kind of take care of itself, you know. So I guess that's my answer. So you just gave me an idea for a new workshop for Diane for next year. Instead of Wisdom of the Elders, Music of the Elders. <laughs> <laughs> we've We're not dead yet. <laughs> we've actually been talking about um, doing a workshop, Wisdom of the Young Ones, and what we can learn from mm. them. Yeah. Mm. That would be a great idea. I think idea. that's excellent. Great idea. Yeah. yeah. Let the information percolate up. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you've answered what was the one question that is not often asked of you or never asked of you, and how would you answer it? What advice would you you wish you'd received, perhaps earlier in your career that you didn't get, that you, you could have used, that might have changed things around a little bit for you or made the road a little easier? Learn how to read music. Okay. Yeah, really. That's a good one. You mean you don't know how to read music? <laughs> and, and then the obvious question is why? I mean, why is that important? You, you've had a rich, long, it just important career. It you more. I mean, it's, it, you're grateful that you can play something by ear, but it opens you more if you can read read music too. It, it broadens you musically. Um, I, and I, we're grateful who don't read that we can pay our rent mm -hmm. <laughs> doing what we do, but um, that would be reading music would, would just enhance and then open you up more. Um, My I remember a song that Fred Small wrote, Everything's Possible, talking about, I had wished that somebody had said these words to me, and every time I hear that song, I wish that somebody had said those words to me, and I wonder how, much, how different my life would have become. Well, I'm kind of famous for not taking anybody's advice. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know really what good it would have done, but... Uh... <laughs> Um, but I, well, I was, when we did the Peace March concert, do you remember the song I sang called People of Peace? Yeah. Oh. I wrote a song called People yeah. of Peace, and it was, and the Peace Marchers absolutely loved it, and they asked me to come sing it at the Washington uh, rally. But Pete said to me, you know, Rod, that would be a really good song if the music wasn't so boring. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? He was right. He was absolutely right, and I should have taken his advice. And I, I suppose maybe that would be an overview of what advice I sometimes wish I had taken would be, be maybe be more inclusive in the writing process with other people mm -hmm. and try to improve, you know, that way and learn more from it. But, uh, you know, I was young and stupid and didn't take his advice. Does anybody out there have a question? I just realized we haven't thrown it open. Yes. Yeah. Speak loudly, please, so everybody sure. can hear you. Uh, you were talking earlier about uh, the new performers that are coming up and how exciting that is. My question is, 
what is your take on uh, the demographics of the audience? It seems to me that when I uh, attend events these days, uh, the audience is getting greater. Uh, I know that opera is probably going to be extinct in not many more generations. Classical music in general, I think, is in trouble because not much new stuff is being written that is being listened to by young people. So I'm wondering how focused on well, I get inspired <clears throat> when I go to Nerfer or other places and I see these young people jamming and playing old-timey music. Not that it's my favorite kind of music, but it really is wonderful to see how many young people are really good musicians and watching them jam. And there are a bunch of them here this weekend. I, I think this gentleman has a good point, actually. No, we're talking about the audience. I'm talking about in venues, not, not here. Yeah. You know... Um, if I may, I, I think that we are at a, a bit of a crossroads because we, we have, maybe for the first time in a while, a really super young generation of players. And I would, I think, maybe uh, some kind of way of reaching the general public, the younger generation of the general public, you know, uh, making it clear that this is going on. I mean, the 60s folk revival uh, didn't happen because people from the 1940s uh, started playing in clubs. It, 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 it helped, but it happened because people that were 21 years old started coming along and playing great stuff, and, and, and their peer group heard it and wanted more. Um, I think that that has to you know, kind of get out there. When I, when I booked the speakeasy, I used to very consciously make an effort to have someone like yourself, let's say, and someone like uh, you know, a, a, one of our kids open for you mm -hmm. to kind of... Um, because I wanted the kids to hear you, mm -hmm. and I wanted your audience to hear the kids, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I wanted a full house. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I think those things all go hand in hand, you know. Yeah, um, so I would like to see, a lot of times when I go on the road, I get booked as a solo act, and you know, my fans come, but I wouldn't at all be offended if some, you know, 21-year-old hotshot opened the show and brought 20 of his fans to it, Here too. It I think that would be a great thing to do. Absolutely. Uh, in Philadelphia, there are, uh, I live in an area of South Louder, Ginger, please. Okay, I live in an area in the South Philly, which has been kind of overtaken by hipsters, and a lot of them are good musicians. They play in venues that I can guarantee you, pr hardly <coughs> anybody in this room would ever go into. They're rough. They're they look like little ghetto places. And there's one I'm thinking of particularly. I think Charles is familiar with. It, I just saw Connie's Rick Rack, and it and there's all these tattooed, pierced kids hanging around in it. And most of you would look at that place and say, oh, I'm not going in there. But the other tattooed, pierced kids are going in and they're being exposed to the music. So you don't see it because you don't go to those places. But they're there. I don't know about the other places, but I know in Philadelphia. They're all over the place. Yeah, it was the same thing in the 60s. All the people were not down no, trust me, they're not nearly that shiny. Question. Question over there? Actually, just a follow up on the Folk Festival. Really, it's made a concerted effort to bring young people in here. But it's been actually bring in. I was skeptical because, you know, I'm also concerned about our demographics. And I'm involved in that. But the Folk Festival is being taken over by the community. You know, you can do a little bit you know, um, I, I'm sorry, can I just interject one? Sure, you know, I, every time there's a peace rally at the Washington Monument and there's 100,000 people there, I get 10 letters from people and they'll all send me some article that some 25-year-old newspaper reporter wrote in Minneapolis or Cleveland or something, and the title of the article will be, Where Have the Protest Songs Gone? And they go to the rally and they hear John Cougar Mellencamp sing Imagine and Sheryl Crow sing Blowing in the Wind, and they go, why aren't there any good new songs? Well, of course, there are dozens of great new songs. Why don't they ask the people that are doing current material to do these things? I have a couple of like, uh, comments and suggestions on this topic, too. Um, we have a group of people that have been doing this for a long time, and they have a festival for 10 years, and they where 
we do a couple of things on this front. One, we put the stage of local arts. We have some middle schoolers up to high schools and local musicians that don't tour and aren't professional to a stage of regional and local touring act. So everyone is together. And we'll have an alternative band from Atlanta that's an opening for John Tatsuchi and saying to us, oh my god, that's Wayne Shorter's bass player. I can't believe it. And no one would have put them on the stage next to each other necessarily, but that's what we did. It worked, but also at the same time, I was taking classes with Sarah Lawrence, and they had a folk festival at the college, and it was all you know twenty somethings at this folk festival, but it was terrific. And music, musicians were great, and everyone in the room was in their twenties. And I came in with my children, and then I was in my forties, and we just we just shifted the whole demographic room. Like I hated being at the end of the demographic, but anyway, the point was we <laughs> befriended them. I was like, they were like, wow, our demographic. I'm like, yeah, thanks a lot, but. We, we ended up including them in our book festival. They became our stage managers. They became, you know, um, we, they brought some of their fans. They, they, they became our staff and our friends. And so, and, you know, for people who are presenters, you know, any way you can work with people, bring these people together, whether it's the genre, the ages, you know, working with you know, younger folks, you know, bringing them into your festival. I mean, that, that builds They said people in their 50s and 60s, they listen to us. The young people our age talk throughout our entire sets, don't pay any attention to us. Um, they said it's much more gratifying to play for older people who actually pay attention. Also, there's no dearth of topical political music being written Absolutely. and recorded today. I get 20 CDs a week. There are some very fine songs. They're a very different kind of song than written in the 60s. They're not quite as in your face. They're not quite as rallying as some of the earlier works were. But they're out there, and there's some good writing going on. And it's just different kind of vibe that's happening now where you don't want to learn the song and rush out in the street and sing it. That's the big difference. They're not that kind of song being written as much, but there are plenty of great songs. And all the songwriters, whether they're 20 years old or 70 years old, are still politically aware and still writing. John? When, uh, when, when Rod mentioned Kirsten Maxwell, it just brought to mind that she's young. Last night, Emily Barnes sang. Now, a lot of young people sing. Now, what I think has happened, um, Besides these things and, and these stupid games on the computer, if there was a folk music app on, <laughs> on these things, I bet you young people would listen. Someone should talk about it. Good idea. Bob, you had your hand up? Well, Diane could talk about uh, the 20th anniversary of Earth Day and Baba. Baba Olivenji and what happened. Oh, with the young people, yes. Yeah, yeah. With the young people. Yeah, a, a, a while ago, and obviously it was in the 90s, but um, we produced a 20th anniversary of Earth Day and we did it on both sides of the Delaware River. Uh, and one of the uh, performers that we had was Bala, Baba Alatunji. Mm -hmm. and, um, and nobody had heard of him. Uh, we yeah, yeah, Drums of Passion, because uh, we had a much younger generation there because at this uh, festival that we were running, and it was absolutely amazing to see the young people discover him and dance to him to a point where he went on, he was supposed to be on for 20 minutes, and he went on for an hour and 20 minutes with all of his dancers, and they were just so, so amazed at what their culture was that they had never been exposed to before. Very good. Uh, Rick? Yeah, I've, I've heard this story going back and forth for, since I was in my 20s about what's going to happen when we're gone. And I'm, I'm not worried about it at all. If you've ever been to Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Folk Festival, um, I was there with John Cohen, of all people, and um, I was watching some friends of mine play, uh, uh, but the 20s and 30-somethings are listening to this stuff. They're putting it out there. They're just not getting, there's no big commercial establishment to, 
to push them these days. There is no Columbia Records to put out what they're, what they're doing. Um, and everybody's out there on their own hook at this point. But the music is there, and if anybody's worried about the fact that there's not enough kids listening to this music, I recommend that you go up to Beacon, which is a hotbed of, of stuff. There's places like the Dogwood and the Town Crier. There's kids in their 20s. Uh, any of the Beacon festivals, the Strawberry Festival, the Clearwater Festival, plenty of kids in their 20s and 30s go to the Clearwater Festival in June. Lots of people, all ages there, um, all colors. I'm not worried about it at all. Yes. I think that's something that's hopeful. I just happened to look for apps, but music. I found seven free apps, including Philadelphia Folk Song, uh, Cattlemore Folk Festival, Edison Folk Festival, Folk Alley Player, Folk Music Radio, Newport Folk, Folk Music Radio, even Free Needle. <laughs> you know, you know um, one of the things that, uh, that really helped us get going in the village was making stuff available to people uh, on a lesser risk basis, you might say. I mean, if, if you go into a town and your concert series charges 20 bucks for performers that you know, the only people who've ever heard of them are people that came to Nerfa. It's going to be tough to get young people to come if that's what you want to do is build a younger crowd um, or at least have a younger crowd as part of your bigger crowd. Um, in the village, one of the things that we used to do were called dollar nights where we would have five or six people play for a buck, you know, and those would draw 150 people in a 150 seat club um, because you didn't risk anything. You got to go see, you know, kind of the pick of the... Of the of the new folks and and uh, and then you could go to one of their concerts for ten bucks down the line if you like somebody in particular. Um, maybe uh, you know one one suggestion I would have would be to just have more events that are really open to people that are that don't require such a commitment of uh, funds and uh, and wherewithal. Um, what, what the Folk Song Society has been doing in Philly is great. I, I, I noticed that you really guys are diversifying a lot. You can really see it. But what I kind of mean, I guess, is also on the local level, if you're in a small community and you're having a hard time sustaining a concert series, have we used to have benefits, for example, to speak easy. We would say, hey, you want to play here? Play for free for one night, you know, as one of 10 people. And then all those 10 people, those, those nights would be big nights. Everybody would want to come to those things because it was like an exciting thing to be, to be at and be part of. Josh, what kind of places do you play now? Wherever I can. <laughs> but, but are they more clubs? Or? Um, not as many clubs. No. No, um, as, I, as I used to. Um, a lot of more concert kind of places. But um, I kind of miss mm -hmm. the clubs. There, again, you, you have time to be someplace for a while. And, and meet some of the local people that you would not meet. Or, or there's somebody in, a, in the same town in another club that you have wanted to see. And you have this time maybe to get a chance to, like he was saying before, see somebody that you've wanted to, you've always admired but not been able to, to meet before. So um, yeah, I don't hold myself to I'm only going to do any sort of particular place. I'm... As long as people are friendly and don't throw things, you know, <laughs> let's do it. Rod? Well, I play a huge variety of gigs these days. I'm like a jazz musician who plays folk music. I, I play in a Bob Dylan cover band. Uh, we're doing a rock and roll club this coming Wednesday in Boca Raton. I play uh, shows um, with a group called Rod McDonald and the Humdingers. We just did a show of the Great American Songbook where I had to sing uh, Someone Who Watch Over Me and uh, I Got Rhythm and all these tunes. Uh, I do 75 or so shows of my own music a year and I do about um, another 40 or 50 of other kinds of stuff. I work with an Irish singer playing all the Irish folk songs. I work uh, with... Uh, a uh, couple of groups. It, it's just, it, it, it's, it's all music. And then there's the Rod McDonald thing, you know, when I go out and play <laughs> my own songs. But um, so, I, so I'm liable to do likely any place, you know, large or small, libraries so, to 
concert halls to, uh, you know, little community associations. So you diversified your... Well, I was riding in an airplane about uh, 10 years ago, and I read this interview with a, the keyboard player in a big jazz group called Martin Medeski and Wood. And they asked him, I think it was Medeski, they asked him if he made a living from Martin Medeski and Wood, and he said, oh my God, I wish. And they said, well, how do you make a living? And he said, well, I play grand piano at the Plaza Hotel every Tuesday afternoon at 4 o'clock. I play synthesizer in a German funk band with two Arabic percussionists. I play keyboards for this singer-songwriter who has a record deal with an independent record label. And I do... Um, I do uh, classical, I, oh, he said I play classical, uh, no, I play in, I play piano in an 11 piece swing orchestra, playing 30s swing music, and I play in Martin, Martin Medeski and Wood. And this is the phrase that got me, he said, from all of that, I, ha I hope to make critical mass. <laughs> Meaning, you know, I got a wife and kids, I'm gonna try to feed them any way I can. That's, and I thought, you know, this is not a bad idea. And so I started the Dylan cover band and a couple other things, and now I just, I'm playing as much as I can, you know. All righty, wow, all of a sudden hands are popping up. I personally think it needs to be more emphatically itself. Absolutely. And just stand up for itself and not be pushed around. But Clint? that's me. <laughs> Absolutely. Clint, I'm sorry. Clint, can you stand up? Thanks. The thing that people are forgetting, too, is that music education in the last 30 years has suffered in the schools. And, and, and anyone, and I'm sorry this is more of a comment than a question, but you know, I'm a former music teacher and you know, I had to give that up to be out on the road and actually be a musician. And the tension, the fact that I can't be a musician and a music teacher, you know, and support myself is is just the truth that discourages me on one level. And so anytime you get the chance to work in the elementary school, especially elementary or middle school, and bring your music to them, especially public schools, because a lot of the music that Rod, the musicians that Rod's talking about, Younger musicians that are really good, a lot of them are homeschooled. And a lot of them, you know, have grown up in families that are musicians. And uh, just anytime you can reach out to a public school or work with your school board and advocate for music education, that's what's driving a lot of the, the grain that we're seeing. You know, the fact that the kids just don't know that it's out there. They've never tried to play a guitar or a piano or a banjo or a mandolin. And, and it's not their fault that they're not being exposed to it. It's the, the administration and the schools and the fact that we have 30 years of, of science and research that says that the music makes our brains better and we're not funding it yet. All the research that's saying football is killing our kids' brains and we're never going to have fun with it. Very good point. for you. Well said. Well, you know, though, I, I think we can't wait you, it's another example of you can't expect them to do it for us. Uh, I, I've, heard, I've done a couple things for the uh, organization called the Tucson Kitchen Music Association, which raises grant money privately to get people to go perform in schools. That's its mission. And uh, I sang in this one high school in Tucson and a bunch of the kids, and I sang my own songs. And they would sit there and they would go, you know, like, well, talk to me about this song. And they would, and, and it would create a dialogue. And then a couple of them came up to me afterwards and said, I'm just starting to play guitar. You know, I'd like to learn to write songs like you do. And I would try to steer them to somebody locally that would do that. I mean, I think it, it really does come down to a kind of local initiative, what happens locally. You know, uh, I, what... What Seeger always said, you know, think globally but act locally, is really the key to it, to it all, in my opinion. It's, it's uh, uh, it, it, if, if in your community you feel there's not, you know, enough arts education for kids, start some. Don't wait for somebody else, or it won't happen. When, when I was in elementary school, we had something called a music appreciation class. They would take us into the auditorium, 
and they would play records of classical music. I never heard any classical music at home. I'd never heard any of it. And to this day, I still hear some of the songs, and I recognize them that I heard in that classical music class. I would love to see the same thing being done. The kids don't hear any of our traditional folk music songs. They don't know what folk music is. They need a class. They need to be made to listen to it. And, and if they were if exposed to it, then they would enjoy it, they would understand it, they would spread it. And I feel very strongly about that. If I can, if, if, if I can footnote that, your, our problem is that we now have a group of children that are growing up that have missed this whole music experience that many of us grew up with, the, the music appreciation classes, etc. But they will become the future administrators that did not grow up listening to this music, and they will be the future people that will say, we don't need this music. And okay. therein lies the big problem. Um, we have in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Folk Song Society has the Odyssey program, where we have musicians that we um, bring into the schools, and it's incorporated with their social studies. So maybe it'll be um, Kim and Reggie doing songs of the Underground Railroad, or uh, Jeff Kaufman doing sea shanties. It's incorporated into what they're learning about the history, and they're learning the music that goes with it, and I'd really love to see more like that. Well, it's just sad yeah. to say that, that you know, um, in the public schools, if with, they need to be cuts, they'll take away the music. You know, the football all still stays, but they'll take the music away. God. So that's the arts in general. Yeah, absolutely, the arts. That's, that's what we have to fight. That's where we're Wanda, I know. Wanda, yes. <laughs> Probably once a month I get a phone call at my radio station that goes like this. My mom used to make me listen to your radio show. <laughs> but now I like it. <laughs> well that's exactly what I'm talking about. Exposure. Exposure to the music. And if you can just get your schools in your area to start doing that, exposing the kids to traditional folk music. I mean, how hard is that? <laughs> you have to get outside organizations to put the performers in the school. Okay. The school won't do it. Yeah. Because yeah. there's no funding. All right, well, we're, we're very near the end here, and you were given a survey to please fill out on your way out. But I would like each of the performers up here, this is called Wisdom of the Elders. I would like them to impart some wisdom. We'll start with Rod. What kind of wisdom do you have to impart, Rod? I haven't I talked enough? Uh, one sentence will do it. One sentence. All right, all right. I, I, I'd like to respond to what Wanda said. I feel very positive going forward. I feel that, that we're at a great place, that there's a lot of energy and wonderful music happening all around us. And uh, just, I guess what I would say is if you're a, a player, a musician, join in, lend your voice, lend your song. If you're a, a fan uh, or a community person, you know, try to further it in some way. Bring it, bring it to those people that don't know about it yet. Uh, everything, I, I always thought that what made the speakeasy work in the village was just by constantly thinking that we should just keep reaching out to new segments of the community. And, and it, you know, that that, I guess, is a way I... I think it works best. Diane? Um, don't just sit there, do something. That's how I ended yeah. up um, mm -hmm. doing the things that I, uh, what I did for the folk community. And of course, I got more out of it than, than I gave. It's really fulfilling to be able to feel that you're taking part and doing something. And you bring schools here. Okay. Yes, oh, right, that, that, that's true. Another thing. Um, we had a children's program this morning where we brought in the third grade from, I forgot the name of the elementary school, uh, and we brought them in on Thursday morning, and I've been doing that for the past 20 years or so at NERFA, where we'll bring in a local school and have our performers um, perform for them, and there's multiple reasons for this in that we want the presenters to see how well children respond to these performers so that they should consider adding family programming to um, their venue, maybe on an afternoon or um, uh, a weekend during the day or something like that. 
All right, Josh. Like Falcon Reach. Well, and just to it's listen. up to you, yes, Josh. You, know, you listen. When you listen, it'll it'll evoke in you what 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 your response should be. But make sure you keep your ears and eyes open to listen. When you do that, you find out where you're going to go. But if you if, if you're doing other stuff, you keep your ears open, and it'll it'll take you where you're supposed to go. Listen. All right, and I'd like to thank Bruce Swan for co-hosting here. It's a privilege. Thank you, Sonny. On behalf of the, um, the children's table, if you will, I meet a lot of musicians, and I talk about Nerf, and I talk about how great it is and how wonderful my experiences have been here these two years that I've been attending Nerf. I think that we as musicians, or you as musicians, need to tell more of your colleagues about Nerf. I will see musicians and say, do you know about Nerf? And they say, no, to what? And so I tell them about it, and I say, you need to come. This is really important for you. This is important for your career and for your colleagues. Please come. Please make it part of your, your fall plans. And some do, but I think that we need to talk more <laughs> about NERFA to more of our colleagues as DJs, as uh, entertainers, as musicians, because it's very, very important. It's, it's critical. And I, it's, I'm really proud uh, to be part. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Sonny. Sonny Oaks. Yes, thank you, Sonny. All right, now go eat. Thank you. <laughs>